Hello and welcome. A classical actor with roots in the Middle East, he trained in London. This quiet-spoken talent faced the challenge of being one of the few Arabs in the British film industry in the 1960s, but he worked hard to change the stereotypes. This week on One on One, meet veteran performer and actor Nadim Sawalha. He's one of those faces you see regularly gracing the big screen in relatively low-key roles. But Nadim Sawalha has earned the respect of his industry as an actor who can bring emotion to life, whether in English or Arabic language. Sawalha describes himself as having Arab roots and universal branches referring to his origins in the deserts of Jordan and education in the cosmopolitan city of London, where he studied drama. Early days as a scriptwriter and radio producer at the BBC evolved into acting in Arabic, even translating Shakespeare. At that time, roles for Arabs were few, and he often passed for other nationalities. When finally recognized as an Arab, Sawalha was pigeonholed and presented with the challenge of negative stereotyping. He persisted to overcome these and managed to secure interesting and varied roles, something he continues to perform to this day. Nadim, it's great to speak with you. Thank you. I know you, you've, you've had a, a long career in acting, and you always say you have Arab roots, but universal branches. Oh, lovely. Sounds you know? very good. And, uh, and I wonder how, you know, that mix is, uh, how that mix applies to you, what it's done for you in your, in your career, you know, having this mix. I have always had confidence in my roots. In, I had enormous confidence in who I am. I knew where I came from and I knew that we have good things and we have bad things and if we pursue the good side of ourselves then we have nothing to fear and therefore as an Arab through the good times and the bad times I have always had good times because I trusted in the judgment of other people. I never had a chip on my shoulder as an Arab ever, ever. To what extent is, uh, is there some change in attitude towards creating roles? I mean, certainly when you started out acting, they would tend to take a white actor and brown them up to make them foreign. Yes. Uh, do you find there's yes. a diversity in roles now? Oh, now it's, it's terrific now. I mean, the variety of parts. You know, when I first started, mainly it was Indian actors who were working. Arab actors were right out of sight. So I developed an Indian accent <laughs> to try and get some work. <laughs> I fooled them for a while. <laughs> but of course, when they found out you're Arab, then suddenly you, oh, you say you were pigeonholed oh, oh, after that. They almost apologized for the mistake. <laughs> I remember going for an audition um, as an Indian, and I was, uh, you know, discovered to be an Arab. So the casting director took me down the corridor. She said, I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know you were an Arab. <laughs> but we're actors, you know, it doesn't matter. But that pigeonholing is, is quite terrifying. You've, pe you've played uh, Spaniards, you've played a variety of roles. Haven't yes, you? yes, yeah. yes. Every now and then I managed to sneak, you know, past the censor, so to, so to speak, pa past the casting directors and uh, get a different part. But if they have a, you know, a real hold on you, because they want to show the directors and the producers that they have Arabs and they have Indians and they have Africans and everybody in their proper compartment. And therefore, you want an Arab? I'll get you. <laughs> and they don't want the Arab to stray into the Indian compartment. To what, to what extent uh, have you come across roles where you've had to say, no, I won't do this. It doesn't fit with my either moral base or philosophy or anything? I think in my, in, in my career, I did that, I remember, um, about three times. You know, because I put the desire to learn above everything else because that's why we are in the West to learn you know to, to, to improve our techniques and the beautiful thing uh, uh, about it is that now I can go back and take my European technique into the Arab field and find that it serves me well but I always said you know okay probably my uh, compatriots and my friends will say why did you do that and I will say because I wanted to learn if I keep turning down every job I'm not gonna learn anything at all Tell me about your uh, early childhood. You were born in Jordan yeah. at a time before Israel and before the, the current troubles that sort of define the region now. Yeah. What was that time like for you? Well, it was a time of innocence, of course. It was a, a time of uh, frugality. 
if there is anything. Um, and uh, one grew up into an innocent world, really. And then we almost had to hurtle during a period of 30 years. We had to hurtle three, through 100, 300 years of progress, really. But as, as a child, it was, it, it was for all children, you know. It, it's, a, it's a bad time and it's a good time and an innocent time. Um, I loved it. I mean, I, I loved my childhood. It was adventurous. It was fun. Um, and then circumstances took me to an English school and from there on to London and so on. You know, just going back to that childhood time, you, I know you acted in a few productions in grammar school in, as, yeah. as, a, as a youngster. Yeah. Uh, was, was there a burning passion in you to act from an early age? Um, I think I come from a family. We have a burning passion to express ourselves. And I believe that probably as a tribe, you know, I, I think the tribes in Jordan, I hope I'm right, they were specializing, you know, some of them would, were judges, some of them were horsemen, some of them were, you know, knife makers and that kind. And I think we were poetesters. I remember I have an uncle, I, you know, uh, I knew him as a child, and he was always writing rhymes, criticizing people in the tribe, so to speak. And I think our acting is an urge to make a social comment. And I think that goes back into the roots of the poetesters amongst the tribes. Because, you know, my brother's an actor, my two daughters are actors, my grandchildren are coming up now. <laughs> so there must be something in the genes and the blood, I'm sure. Tell me about that early time, though, you know, the, the time of life in the Middle East then, because for so many people, it's something they couldn't even imagine. A generation, a couple of generations, obviously, since then, wouldn't even know that time. No. No, I, I know m not my children, but my nephews, uh, Nabil's children, sit with me and they are spellbound when I talk to them about, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, how um, my relationship to my grandfather when I would go to storytelling nights with him and I'd sleep inside the sheepskin he was wearing and doze off, you know, while they talked about great battles and we attacked and we went and the camels dashed here and the horses there and one man was wounded, you know, they were <laughs> the innocent times. It seems sad that that seems to have been lost completely in the Middle East. Now, what defines the Middle East is so different. The violence, yeah. There was no violence at my grandfather's time. And another thing, he would get really either on his horse or his camel and travel to Syria to buy tobacco. Nobody stopped him on the way. Nobody asked him who he was. And and now since all the divisions and the visas and the arrests and all the horrors it, it's unbelievable but my grandfather traveled from south jordan across to damascus on horseback probably to buy tobacco and nobody asked him who, who he was or wh where was he going of course a lot of people forget that at that, that time arabs and jews muslims and jews Got on very well. Oh, there yes. was no division, really, was that? Oh, yes. And it's uh, quite fascinating, really, when, when we meet um, our Jewish friends from Baghdad and uh, Casablanca and, you know, the Arabs, the Jews of, uh, of the Arab world, you know, and we're just, we're just Middle Eastern people. You know, there is, there is nothing there, nothing. I've got, you know, some friends I work with in, uh, who came from Baghdad, and they still have the... Uh, I did a film recently in Tunisia, and there were a couple of Israeli actors, and they were playing Iraqi characters in a film about Saddam, you know. And they said when we went to Israel first, we couldn't say, you know, my mother is, is, is Iraqi. He said, but things have changed now. If you have an Iraqi mother, you're top of the heap. <laughs> <laughs> what influences uh, did your parents have on you, particularly in terms of character? You said you had that almost like thespian, or at least performer gene almost yes, in, your, yes. in your family or your tribe. Um, yeah. But your, individually, your mother and your father, what influences do they have? How do they shape you? I think, I think they say you need what you need, the three eyes, industry, imagination. And I think my father had the imagination. You know, because he was a true Bedouin. He lived and died dressed up, you know, in his Bedouin clothes. And he was a stoic, a Bedouin in a stoic fashion, turned his back to civilization. My mother came from other, another branch of the family, but they were industrious. Her grandfather was the first man to bring, um, you know, the mill, uh, 
to, to mill the, the flour in, to, to, to our village. So probably I got the imagination and the wish to fly from my father and probably I got the ability to travel in an airplane or a train <laughs> from my mother. <laughs> so in that way my father was not really interested in the future at all. I mean when I told him I was going to England he just turned around and oh God you know you could see it on his face. But my mother was very keen, very keen for us to go out and experience the world. She said to me actually when I was uh, quite little she said the fabric of the tribe with time will be torn to bits and if you hang on to it you're gonna fall behind way behind your your, your brother Nabil also has followed that path though, hasn't he? Yes. did he take that advice too then yes he did my yes it's very true it's my it's my generation really who developed an awareness of the outside world and I think that was due to the uh, influence of the Second World War because that's when I first my, saw my first tank my first soldier, my first weapons, my, my first, first pink skin, English skin. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the period when we realized that there is a world way beyond the village where we, where we lived. Um, and after I went to England, yes, Nabil, Nabil followed as well, and hundreds of thousands of us, of course. Nadim Dungo, we're going to take a very short break here. We're back with more one-on-one -on -one in just a moment.